Welcome to Outside of the Classroom. Education is important, but not that bullshit, abstract, and theoretical education. You want useful, relevant, and actionable lessons that will help you succeed in life. So that's what we do. It's your boy Tam Fam, your host, and now let's hack your education together. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Tam Fam, and our guest today is Dave Fontenot. He is most known in the hackathon community for being one of the loudest voices advocating for hackathons. So if you want to learn more about tech, startups, or turning your idea into reality, this episode is perfect for you. But before we start, I want to announce that I am launching a new book called Networking Success for Young Professionals. This book is short, funny, and will give you all the tips and strategies I've used to connect with top-level entrepreneurs and professionals. So if you're interested, enter your email address at www.outsideoftheclassroom.com slash networking to get notified of your free copy once it comes out. And again, it is www.outsideoftheclassroom.com slash networking. So without further ado, let's dive into the show. Hey, what is going on, everybody? We have a very special guest today. Dave Fontenot is the founder of HackMatch, which helps hackers find the right startup to thrive in. He was also the former MHacks organizer, the largest student-run hackathon, and he is leading the hacker renaissance to a school near you. Dave, you just finished an amazing TED Talk, and I'm so happy to be talking to you today. So, Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Tam. Glad to be here. Awesome. So how was your TED Talk, by the way? <clears> oh, <throat> yeah. We just watched it for the first time because it, it took them a while in post production to come out with the videos, um, but it, it was it, it was a lot of fun. You know, uh, the audience that was there is it was this event TEDx Teen. Uh, the audience was like you know a few hundred teenagers, um, and then a bunch of people on live stream, of course. But the audience was just giving me so much energy, and and as a hopeless extrovert, I was just feeding off of that. So uh, I got pretty into it. That's awesome. And it was on the main stage. Was it in New York? Where was it at? Yeah, yeah, in New York. Um, yeah, I think it was at a SAP's uh, auditorium in, in Soho. That's so sweet. I really enjoyed watching it. And I'm just curious, when you go to like a party and someone asks you what do you do, what do you say? Do you say you're a hacker? Mm, I usually tell them that I'm a writer because uh, that's what I spend most of my time doing and I feel like it's the most apt description. Um, but I guess writer could be loosely defined to also write code. Um, mm -hmm. But I spend most of my time writing uh, English words. Um, so... I've been, especially more recently over the last uh, month, I've kind of devoted myself these, these uh, last month onto these next two months. Um, I'm, I'm trying to become a great writer and really focusing on, you know, figuring out what it's going to take to get me there. Uh, so I guess that's, that's what I, either a writer or an artist is what I identify the most with because I feel like, you know, code, Photoshop, a lot of these things, there's just different mediums of expression and I'm just trying to express myself to the world. No, most definitely. So what do you normally write about? Do you write on your blog and then do you write about tech and um, entrepreneurship? Um, what topics do you write about? Yeah, so I mean, for a good couple years, I was one of the first people writing about hackathons. And that's actually the reason I get, you know, way too much credit for a lot of this hackathon stuff is just because I was the only person really writing about it. Uh, you know, T Tessa Nearson actually had started before me and, and she was really popular and then she stopped writing as much and I kind of took up the torch there. Um, so I used to write about hackathons. Now I write a lot of different stuff and I'm really trying to push myself in, 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 in many different directions. Mm -hmm. Uh, so more recently I haven't been publishing that much, but I've been writing more than ever. And I've been writing a lot of poetry. Um, I just started songwriting, uh, and then I'm writing a, a longer form research paper on, uh, the Renaissance, particularly, uh, the parallels, um, uh, between the previous Renaissance and now. Wow, that's so interesting. What what inspired you to, to to write all this stuff? Um, so, just in general, I'm I, I'm really huge extrovert, and I'm constantly trying to express myself to the world. And I found that that writing is uh, is is really important because it helps me, you know, figure out what I'm thinking to begin with. It helps me flesh out my thoughts and understand myself better. And once I've done that, then I can, you know, better convey that to the rest of the world. Um, so I think that's like really the driving force is just, I have, I feel like I have like in, in, in once like our, uh, our first album comes out and you hear some of the songs, you'll be able to hear some of the emotion here. Like I just have so many thoughts like pent up inside and so many feelings and I want to express those to the world. I want to express those to people. Um, but first I have to understand them myself. Um, and I found that writing is one of the most effective ways for me to do that. That's awesome. And what time do you usually write? Is it in the morning, night owl? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely in the morning. So, I mean, today I got off to like a pretty late start, woke up at like, you know, 8.20 a.m., um, but usually I try to wake up with the sun. I have a window that faces the sunrise. So when, when the sun comes up, it just beams into my room. And instead of trying to fight it, I decided, you know, let me try to wake up with the sun every day. Uh, so that's really great. Wake up with the sun, walk out on the patio, stretch for a bit. Um, and then I try to get into reading and writing. And I'm trying to just build up as much focus, uh, creative, focus on my creative energy as possible uh, so that I can both read and write more each day. Mm. Um, so those are my primary goals. Cool. So you wake up, you um, stretch out, wake up for the natural sunlight, you go outside and stretch, um, have some water maybe, and then you just still go straight into writing? Or do you read first? What's I usually read first. Yeah, I usually read for a couple hours first. Wow. Um, yeah, well, one of the most important things when you're, when you're writing is, is reading, of course, because you, know, you want to see how the, the, the really great artists of, of words, the really great writers – you want to see some of the techniques that, that, they were do, that they were using, and hopefully that can inspire you in your own writing. I've found that it has in, in, in my writing. That's awesome. Well, just, just to say way back, I w for the listeners who don't know what a hacker is or what a hackathon is, um, could you just quickly define um, the, the two words for me? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I'll define hackathon first just because it's something that's really coming to the forefront right now. A hackathon mm -hmm. is a marathon. Uh, where you turn an idea into reality. And people come to these events uh, together and they can build anything. They could build um, a table uh, they want for their house. They could build uh, a new alarm clock. Uh, but most often what we see is that they build apps. And actually the reason that they build apps is super interesting and not something that people guess at first. It's that that apps are actually easier to build than these other things. It's easier to build an app than a table. Um, it's easier to learn how to do how to build an app, how to build a website, than than to build something physical. So that's actually why people tend to build software. Is that a lot of these people are coming to a hackathon have never built anything before. I've never built uh, outside of IKEA furniture. I've never built a table. <laughs> have never built an app, and it's just easier to learn how to build an app than a table. Um, so that's what you see most, most often at these hackathons. Um, a hacker has, has a, a more general definition. Um, hack, ha the, 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 this whole hacker thing is more of a mindset than, than having to do anything with coding or tech. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's pretty much what I, what I like to define it as. It's the growth mindset applied to everything. Um, so, so it's that no matter what obstacles come in your way, you're going to hack your way around them. And a lot of people think when they first hear the word hacker, they think someone's going to hack into your Facebook or <laughs> hack into your computer. And yes, the term can fit that sort of thing too, um, but it's really taking on this broader meaning of, of someone who's not going to let obstacles stop them, who's going to Google for the answer, who's going to ask their friends for the answer, and is going to figure a way around something, figure a shortcut or just figure out how to hack something together rather than hack something apart. So you can see the word is still the same root, hack. Um, the people who are breaking into stuff are hacking things apart. The people who are building stuff are hacking things together. Mm -hmm. um, it does imply, you know, sort of this, uh, this, this brute force, um, this, like, uh, you know, perseverance, um, this, this willingness to take shortcuts. It implies a lot of these things, and, and that's okay. But it's, wow. it's more of, like, a, a, a mindset for... Uh, for growth and for learning than it is about coding or anything to do with technology. Um, no, yeah, I love so it. I love it. Like the theme of outside of the classroom is hacking the education that school never gave you. So just kind of taking short, not shortcuts, but really helping anyone listening to be the best that they possibly can be. So I, I love that definition. Mm -hmm. So when, so walk, walk me through this. So say I don't know how to code at all, which is partly true. And I go to a hackathon, and mm -hmm. I don't know how to code, don't know how to program. What what happens next? Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot, a lot of things can happen um, <laughs> at a hackathon. Really, anything can happen. But but most likely, you'll probably join a team of okay. people who are around the same skill level as you. Um, a lot of people like to say that they're non-technical, but in reality, you know, almost everyone knows how to type. Almost everyone knows how to surf the web. Fifteen years ago, if you started studying CS. You would spend your first year 
just in typing classes for the most part. Um, so, so every, pretty much everyone, not, not everyone, but everyone who can type and can, can use, you know, Chrome or Firefox or Safari, they're, they're technical. It's just about whether you're flexing that, that skill or not. Um, and you would probably join a team of people who are similar skill who might just, you know, know how to browse the web and, and type. Um, and you would probably try to figure out how to build something. Um, I usually recommend to people to try mobile apps because they're surprisingly easy to build and there's a lot of documentation online that just walks you through how to build them. Mm -hmm. um, but you could really build anything. So that's why it's hard to define what your experience would be like. I went to my first hackathon and I'd never built something before. I didn't even have a laptop when I showed up. I hadn't owned my first computer. Um, so I ended up just like joining a team with this guy, John, and uh, pair programming with him. We were both just like figuring out Rails. Um, he was teaching me a lot. And all we did was put up a really simple landing page um, where we would accept emails for this physical non-tech product that I was building. Um, and I thought it was the coolest thing. I could send this link to my mom. <laughs> she could go on her computer, access it, and she could put down her email that she was interested in, in buying this door cover that I was designing. Yeah. So, cool. so it could be something as simple as building a personal website or, you know, as, as, as cool as like get, you know, building a mobile app from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, and that's totally feasible to do your first hackathon, even if you've never coded before. But could you build like a podcast maybe? Is that possible? Oh yeah, you could build a podcast. So like at, at Michigan now there's like five different hackathons. So we started M Hacks at Michigan. Um, there's like five different hackathons there now. And one of them's uh, called a, the Filmathon. Mm -hmm. And in 24 hours, uh, people get together and they make their first film. Uh, that's awesome. So, so you, can, you can create anything really. It's just like way easier to create an app than a film. Yeah, but why are some people so intimidated with coding and making apps? They, they think that it's the hardest thing ever, but the way you explain it, it sounds like everything's already documented, people that are help you, and, and so on. Yeah, I mean, code looks fucking intimidating, man. <laughs> when I look at code, I'm scared. It's just, it's just visually, when you look at this stuff, at first, even when you look at the documentation, it's very intimidating. It's a lot all at once. And, it, and it's, but, it, but it's just like with learning anything. You don't need to understand everything from the start. You just need to kind of dive in and start testing things out, seeing where they break um, and, and figuring it out. Like you're going to run into problems and, and that's totally fine. Um, that's the big thing, like the, this hacker mindset that people have to get is that even the best programmers are going to try to run their code and then it's, you know, it's not going to work. There's going to be errors <laughs> for some reason, but the real beauty is in, uh, is in the process that you go through to figure out what's going wrong. Um, and you can consistently figure out what's going wrong in these things. Yeah, so these hackathons are actually really similar to just going to the gym for the first time. You already, you can look at the dumbbell and you know that you can lift it and that's probably good for you, but really getting that technique down, you're gonna wanna have the help of a personal trainer or other people at the gym. And that's like at a hackathon, you have these more experienced programmers and instead of, you know, trying to compete with you, what you actually find when you go to these events is, is that these more experienced programmers are helping these people who are programming for the first time. And that, that, gives, that, that makes hackathons the perfect environment to learn how to code and learn how to build things for the first but, time. But is hackathons not a competition? Um, it is to some people. Hackathons are a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, the competition aspect really isn't that big. There's probably, like, at a... Some of these hackathons are like a thousand people, and the thousand-person hackathon, there's probably like a hundred or two hundred people who care about the prizes at all. Um, but even then, there's still even among that group, there's still this. Uh, the culture of it is that uh, most of these hackers want to see the cool stuff built more than anything. They like they hear about a hack that will probably beat them in the competition aspect, and they would r way rather see that hack successfully than win the competition. Um, just because some of the stuff that, that these people are trying that end up winning is just so ambitious. Wow. It's, it's stuff that, that, you know, most people would say can't even be built or is going to take, you know, months, maybe years to build. And then in a weekend, they have a demo at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to see this stuff built because you want to <laughs> use it yourself a lot of the time. And it's just really, really cool. So there's not too much, you know, the competition aspect of it's pretty de-emphasized. Yeah. Were there any big tech companies now that would form out of a hackathon? Or any cool uh, so startups I mean, that are out right now? Yeah, so there's probably two, two cool examples I can give right now. Um, and, and I think this is just the, the tip of the iceberg here because these hackathons are really just getting started. Um, yeah. The biggest one is 
Me, which got acquired uh, for, for $80 million, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. And they started at a hackathon. Um, and, then, and then probably a newer example uh, was about a year ago at, at MHAX3 in Detroit, um, the, the winning team had built this app called Workflow uh, that let you make apps out of apps on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty much on your phone, you can make apps. Um, and I actually live with them now. And they were, when they <laughs> launched in uh, about, they launched like eight months after the hackathon, uh, after, after polishing it up a ton, uh, they hit number one on the app store right away. Um, so that app's super, super popular and, and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people have downloaded it now. Um, so, so that's probably the most prominent rising example. Workflow, I mean, if you, you, should, you should download it and try it out. Really, really powerful app. Like I can't believe something like this is really pushing the limits of you know, iOS. And, it's, and it blows my mind that something that pushes the limits could actually be started at a hackathon. Mm -hmm. And you're living with them, so that's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they hadn't come to the hackathon and built this, they might still be in school right now. Um, they, they, they all dropped out too. So. Hey, what's up guys? I want to take a quick pause right now and tell you about my new book, Networking Success for Young Professionals. And I share with you the exact tips and strategies I've used to build my network, which leads me to job opportunities, promotions, new friends, and so much more. And it's sad because I have to often turn down opportunities because I just can't handle it all. And I'm not saying this to brag. I'm telling you this because just a few years ago, I was a nobody. And today, people are offering me help. People want to hire me. People want to meet me for coffee. Now, how did this magic happen? So find out more in the book. And if you want to join the email list, and you get notified for a free copy before I raise the price in the future. So you really have nothing to lose. So enter your email address at www.outsideoftheclassroom.com slash networking to get on the email list and get this free book when it comes up. Again, it is www.outsideoftheclassroom.com slash networking um, to get the free book. So now back to the show. So tell me more about wh where you live. Is it like a hacker house? Is that correct? Uh, we call our home mission control. It's a really tight knit community. Uh, I wouldn't call it a hacker house. I think it's really something of its of its own. Everyone in the house is uh, an artist of sorts. So we have th these two huge chalk walls, for instance, where there's just crazy drawings everywhere. Um, just about every night, you'll see us jamming on our patio, making music. On once a month on Friday, we host this thing called Freestyle Friday, which is actually where uh, where we met, um, <laughs> where we bring together you know fifty plus friends um, who have never rapped before, and we teach them how to freestyle rap. Um, so a lot of crazy stuff like that. So we have this we have this like hosahedron hanging, which is twenty sided. Uh, I guess it's not a cube if it's twenty sided, but twenty sided sh uh, shape. And uh, I think that really represents the house because the house is so multifaceted. Almost everyone in the house isn't just a designer, isn't just a coder. Um, they're all um, you know, artists uh, in, in, in many senses of the word. Um, so I think that's probably the bigger theme uh, of the house itself. Most of the, the housemates have their own offices that they work out of um, to separate that that work in in, in, in life. And um, the guy, I mean. There, yeah, yeah. I, you know, Freestyle Friday was actually really fun. I never actually rapped in front of like a group of people before, and I just kind of went out there, did it. You were there supporting me. Eric was there supporting me, and yeah. the, everyone was just so supportive. So. I guess that what that's like how it feels to be at a hackathon, most likely, huh? Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's almost like a freestyle Friday is almost like a hackathon for learning how to freestyle. Rap. <laughs> that's really cool. So, Dave, I just want to ask you a, a broader question. Um, mm -hmm. You you're seen as like one of the most connected people in the in this tech space. So, you know, not not just young people, but tech as in like companies and startups. I feel like if you wanted to, you can just reach out to anybody and ask them for a job. Like, is that true? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting thing. So, so a lot of people say like, you know, Dave, you're so connected, this and that. Um, one of the, the, the things that I always try to do is instead of asking people for intros, um, because I could probably get intros to, 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 to most people, I always try to reach out cold because I always want to be able to empathize with, with that hustler inside of me um, who's, who's constantly trying to make moves and, and, you know, not be dependent on other people. So, Usually when I'm reaching out to people, I'm actually not asking for intros any. Uh, I, I actually just never really have. Um, I ask for intros sometimes, but usually I'm just reaching out cold. I'm just cold emailing them, uh, mm -hmm. Facebook messaging them, tweeting at them. I'm just trying to reach them in, in ways that, that other people haven't. And I'm, I'm still constantly surprised at how effective this is. So it really leads me to believe that anyone can reach a lot of these people. That Silicon Valley, like, you can actually just cold email a lot of these founders 
and get in touch with them. That's the primary way. It's just faster for me than asking for an intro that I can just, you know, Facebook message a founder um, and, and get in touch with them before that intro would even be sent. Um, so I always try to stay, you know, you know, empathize and, and stay, stay down to, to my, you know, uh, basics as like a, a hustler. And also because I just want to like be really good at writing these cold emails, these cold messages. Um, so that if I ever can't get the intro, then I, I still can reach out to people. Um, so yeah, I can probably get intros to, to most people out here, but usually I'd rather reach out to them cold just for the challenge. Interesting. So even though it's the easy way out, you just kind of want to do it yourself, um, practice your writing and just make that personal or try to make uh, that in-person, impersonal relationship into a personal one. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it's actually the, the strange thing is that I think it's actually easier to reach out cold most of the time. Like a lot of people think that they need this like heavy intro to like get in touch with someone. Um, in New York, I don't know how true this is, but in San Francisco, like I can cold message most people, even if they've never heard of me before and get in touch with them. Um, you just have to, you just have to really show that, that you've done your research and that you're interested. Um, and I often easier and faster than asking someone for an intro. I love it. So who, who is, uh, someone that you recently cold emailed or cold message and, and how did you go through the process? Did you have to research them and then did you have to... Um, right, like relate to them in some way. Walk us through that process. Yeah, so the startup came out pretty recently called Triple Byte, and they're doing something very similar to what I was doing with Hack Match. So I was super curious. Uh, one of the YC partners, Harsh Taggart, uh, let, you know, you know, decided to to jump off and and start this. Um, and I really love some of the research they're doing. So I reached out to Harsh. I just shot him a cold email, Harsh at triplebyte.com, and he responded. And we're, we're week um so that's a good i guess now is i really wanted to bring out uh alexis sohanian and and, uh, and sam altman i'm not sure if you're familiar with them alexis sohanian yeah, founded Reddit, Reddit, and yeah. sam altman is the president of y combinator i really wanted to bring them out to m hacks the hackathon i had started at michigan so i just called facebook message both of them and the next semester they were speaking at m hacks um so yeah <laughs> wow Cold, e cold message on Facebook, not even an email. Yeah, I think the, the cold message on Facebook is definitely way more effective. Like this shit is like, the response time is, is so fast. Like I think a <laughs> lot of people think it's like weird to, there, there's like a social stigma to like shooting someone a Facebook message if you don't know them or you're not friends with them. Uh, and I guess the part of my brain that sees these like social barriers and stuff just doesn't really exist. So I never really saw it as a problem. And I've just been doing that. I, I, I do that way more than I cold email or, or cold <laughs> tweet uh, at people. No, I, I love that mentality. So do you use Facebook as your main like messaging channel? Hello? I'm quitting email like next year. Like I pretty much don't use it already. Um, when people email, there's sending them like, here's my calendar, like just schedule a call on whatever slots open, or I'm sending them a message that like, is, is, is like, Hey, let's jump to Facebook messenger. It's just so much personal. Like I'm not trying to like do, you know, business transactional. I'm trying to build like real relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to build like lasting relationships. Um, and, and Facebook messenger facilitates that, right? I don't want to, I don't want to message an address, I don't want a phone number. I want to message a person. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Can you can you hear me fine? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I, I think I lost you for one sec and then you're back on. So awesome. good, good. So I would love to take take. Um, I feel love, I would love for you to take us on your journey. So you, um, what you like? Why are you so obsessed with hackathons? You went to your first one at MHAX, and you were how old? Eighteen, I believe. Uh, this is at, at Michigan, but it wasn't MHAX. This is before MHAX had started. Oh, yeah, um, Penn Hacks, yeah. I right? guess no. This was uh, it was called Hack Age. Hack A2 Thon, A2 being Ann Arbor. Mm, okay. Yeah. So so walk, walk us through that. So after that hackathon, what happened next? Okay. So yeah, after this hackathon, I just thought it was so cool that like there was something on the internet that I put there. You know, growing up in South Florida, um, like computers like weren't really a thing beyond playing like video games. Like that was like kind of it. And even then, like my parents kind of viewed computers as like the devil and wanted us to be on computers as 
<laughs> as little as possible, you know, it's like, why aren't you playing outside with the other kids? Um, so, so, you know, being able to put something on the internet just really blew my mind. And like, uh, you know, I was like, wow, in a weekend, I, I learned how to put something on the internet. Like imagine what I could do in, you know, a few weekends or even ne the next weekend that I try to do something. Um, so I went to a startup weekend after that, which is like pretty, I, I guess it's like a different variant of like a hackathon that's more focused on like building startups. Um, and I, I continued working on the same idea. Um, we built out some more stuff. And then after that, I went to uh, the second hackathon at Michigan, which was the Facebook hackathon. Um, and we ended up winning. We built like a meme generator. Uh, memes were just getting super popular. We noticed that Facebook had tweaked their newsfeed algorithm a bit where images were just coming to prominence, where they were giving extra weight to images. So we were like, oh, man, we need to take advantage oh, of this. Uh, we built this app called Buddy Meme, and we ended up winning that hackathon. Um, long story short, uh, a few months later, we got to uh, Facebook flew us out to headquarters, and we got to uh, we got to hang out with Zuck and show him the app and stuff. So that was really, no really cool. No way. Yeah. So having just started, uh, you know, getting into this whole you know hackathon thing, having just started learning how to code, and then you know building social apps, and then getting to meet uh, Zuck and and come out in and, and come out to San Francisco for the first time was just really, really eye-opening. So we just couldn't stop going to hackathons after that. We, we went into our sophomore year of, of college at Michigan. We told ourselves that we wanted to travel every other weekend because there was a lot of awesome people at Michigan, um, but, but you know, majority of the awesome people were distributed around the world. So we needed to go find them. This was, I was working with my buddy Raj Veer, uh, and we were just constantly building shit. We spent the whole summer, that summer, just working on another meme product called memeit.com um, and just learning a ton. Um, and, uh, and so That's we started insane. sophomore year about six days before, uh, the event, we found out about this, this first multi-university pen apps, which it really was the, the first, um, mega hackathon, um, if I can define the term, um, and they, this pen apps guaranteed free travel reimbursement. So we immediately, we find out about it like six days before it's like the Sunday, uh, uh, before, before we'd have to leave on that Thursday, we just start getting on the phone and calling all of our friends and, and most of our friends, like they're not studying CS. Yeah, so these are just our random friends in college. And we're like, Hey, like there's this free trip to Penn. We're going to build apps. It's going to be really, really fucking dope. <laughs> um, and next thing you know, on Thursday, uh, we're leaving with like four Michigan vans, uh, to Penn apps. Uh, we're bringing wow. 25 students with us. Most of, most of us were not CS. I was just switching into CS at this point. Um, and we were just blown away, man. Like this pen apps, there were 320 students from like 15 different schools. And that was just like, this was unheard of. Like a, a, even just like a college event where there were so many like intelligent, ambitious people all in the same room sleeping over for like, you know, 24, <laughs> 36, 48 hours. Like that's just insane. You don't get to do that. Nothing else lets you, lets you do that. Mm -hmm. So it's just crazy to see what all these people had built. And actually a lot of the people that I met at this hackathon are now uh, still good friends of mine. Um, and yeah, and, and out like here really in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was the first time that I ever found, you know, there's only a, a very finite subset of people at, at your school that actually build the ideas that they talk about. Mm -hmm. And at this hackathon, there were like 320 of these people. Um, so it was, it was just really, really powerful to even know that this these other people who built shit existed, right? Like back, <laughs> back when this first pen app started, there were probably like a thousand college students in the US who were building apps at all, who were building like, who were actually able to like ship uh, web apps or mobile apps. Like they're just like, most people that are studying CS don't actually build anything. They're doing like theory and, and they, they can't build apps. Um, so, so meeting all these people, like we were meeting a pretty good chunk of, the, of, of our generation of people who actually built shit. Um, so that was really cool. And I think hackathons have actually, without people really noticing, have, have increased by an order of magnitude the number of college students who are building, who are actively building, uh, who are actively building websites and apps. Mm -hmm. That's so sick. I, I just feel like just listening to your story and listening to all your um, explorations, you're so fearless and you're not afraid of challenges of cold emailing or cold messaging or traveling to different places and just going there without knowing how to make an app were you always as fearless or were, is this like something that you've built upon throughout your life uh, i mean i just like don't know what there is to fear right like i have this concept of zero downside um a lot of zero things downside. that people are afraid of actually have zero downside like when you think about it when you're like oh if i go do this and it doesn't work out and the worst case happens 
there's pretty close to zero downside most of the time. People are just like have these irrational fears that like something's going to go wrong. When in reality, there's hardly ever a downside. Um, like going to a hackathon, like what's the worst thing that can happen? You like missed partying that weekend, right? That's like <laughs> not like like yes in college, like partying is awesome. Uh, when you're young, partying is awesome. But like missing a weekend of partying to potentially build something, like that's like a pretty nice trade off. Like I'm not really missing much of anything. So um, so I really don't see what there is to fear here. Um, I think the biggest fear is, you know, just going through your whole life and having all these ideas and just like not knowing how to turn them into reality. Mm, that's a bigger fear. So not, not doing something is a bigger fear than actually risking it and, and not even risking it, but you're not even risking anything. There's yeah, no zero there's downside, no right? Here. There's no, like a lot of people are like, oh, how are you so fearless? All this stuff. I'm like, what is there to fear? Like, what are you talking about? Like, what's like this, like risk that you're talking about? Well, some, some people have this mental barrier where they, they're afraid to talk to people. They're afraid to get out of their comfort zone. They're afraid to do something new, which is why I was just curious. And yeah, maybe and you were that person and you kind of shifted. But it seems like you, you, you had it like pretty nothing to fear your whole life. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that that's true. It's just like uh, this just isn't something like going to a hackathon is not something you, be, you should be afraid of. Like really all you have to do is like get on the bus and show up. And like once you're there, like things just are – are in motion like there's just like an energy there that's going to carry you through um like you don't really like once you if you just show up like you've done a lot of people say like showing up is like 90 percent of the the work like once you show up like the, the, like there's just the energy there that that allows you to do these things like you just look around and you see people who have never built something before building something and you're like oh wow i can do that too um so i think like one of the guiding forces to my life has always just been to surround myself with the people that i want to become more like um, and at hackathons, I was able to do this, right? Like I wanted to be someone who turned my ideas into reality, who actually built stuff. And by surrounding myself with these people, I became one of those people. Um, so I think that's like one of the really powerful things about, ha about a hackathon. If you ever wanted to like build stuff, if you ever wanted to be the type of person who builds things, surround yourself with those people and those people are at a hackathon. So, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm curious about myself. Like how did you overcome the fear of transitioning to like the certainty of, you know, college life? to the uncertainty of like the hack, not the hacker life, but the startup world where you're doing your own ideas and implementing and executing them. How did you transition into that, into space? Oh, I mean, it's stressful, man. Like college was way less stressful than, than, than life has been after dropping out. Um, college, like everything's just kind of like set up for you. You have like these classes that you have to pass. You have very clearly defined goals and metrics of success. Um, as long as you pass your classes, like pretty much nothing else really matters or affects you negatively. You have your relationships like are right there for you. You live in close quarters with a bunch of people who are looking to meet new friends. When you drop out, like now, like what are your metrics of success? You don't know. Like you have to, you have to like define your own. And it doesn't matter what the press says. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. You know, like I don't feel successful right now. I'm still like working my ass off, hustling, trying to, uh, you know, make something of value in the world. Um, so that transition is like definitely not easy. Um, just like you're going from <clears> – <throat> the cool thing about school is that it moves at like uh, at, at, at a certain pace, right? Like you're pushed through to take like a certain minimum of classes. It's curriculum set for you. Uh, when you leave school, you don't have like a, any the, – the only pace is the pace that you set for yourself. Now what's really cool about this is that school moves at a very finite pace. And when you leave school, you now have the ability to limit yourself. This is why I love school because I realized I was just – I love school. I loved my classes. I was learning a ton, but I wanted to unlimit myself. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn faster. I wanted to fly by my peers, not just sit next to them in class. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of really cool benefits here, but there's also this like now you're the only one who's like accountable for yourself. You have to figure out, you know, what are the things that are going to drive you to, to success uh, and whatever that means for you. Um, so it's definitely not easy. It's definitely difficult. Um, I, one of the, the crucial things that got my parents involved in the conversation way before I had actually made the decision to drop out. So I think that helped with, with my parents a bit, but still, even the other day, I just jumped on a call with them like last week, they're still trying to convince me to go back to school and they really don't understand like what I'm doing. Um, and who knows, I don't even understand exactly what I'm doing. Right. Um, so there's this, this uncertainty like that. It, it's even though there's no clear reason of why you should be afraid uh, just uncertainty in general scares people and it scares me and it's very real. Uh, when you drop well, yeah. out, there's much less certainty. Yeah, being a job out myself, I can definitely relate to you and your parent situation. So are you, I'm just curious, are you making money from Hackmatch 
um, to help you survive or is your parents supplying you with money? What's happening? Yeah, yeah. So with Hackmatch, engineers pay me to help them find the right startup. Um, so I charge engineers 10% of their first year salary. Um, so I've made money with that and that's how I'm covering my costs. Um, but but I mm-hmm. think I am going to, uh, you know, now that I'm, I'm writing right now, I'm transitioning away from working on that and I am going to have to figure out how to... Uh, how to bring in income in other ways. So I'm probably going to do, you know, some uh, what I had done before when I first started Hackmatch and dropped out. So I just did freelance, um, and I would find like really niche freelance uh, things that I could get really good at. So I'm probably going to try to do something aligned with my writing. I probably want to do like freelance, uh, freelance copywriting. Writing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to dive into that, right? And see, so, yeah, as a dropout, like I don't have. There's no like clearly defined path here. Um, so that's. That's going to be a fun challenge ahead of me, and I'm really excited to uh, take it on and figure it out. Well, that's awesome. Well, if you need a copywriting book, I actually read um, just one just recently by Joseph Sugarman, and I can definitely recommend it to you after the podcast. Sounds good. Um, so that, that's awesome. Well, I want to dive into a couple of quick rapid-fire questions that um, were curated from Facebook. Um, so just go ahead and answer it very quickly, your first thought off the top of your head. Is that cool? Sounds good. All right. So I can't pronounce his name. The the Jamez, the Jamez asked, "What's your deepest darkest secret?" Oh, gosh, this is tough. I don't I don't even know. I'm pretty I'm pretty transparent. I try to be like live my life as openly as possible, um, outside of infringing on other people's fri- privacy. So I don't know how many you know deep dark secrets I have. I think something that would surprise people is that I have like a lot of imposter syndrome. Um, that I definitely wow. like often find that like, you know, especially as like a programmer, I'm not that great of a programmer yet. And I'm trying to become a better programmer. Uh, and I feel very inadequate in a sense because people have this like heightened uh, uh, perception of how good of a programmer I should be because I helped, you know, do a lot of this hackathon stuff. Um, but I'm actually, you know, still like I've only been programming for a few years now. Um, and I'm still trying to, you know, play catch up with these with these young engineers who've been programming since they were 9, 10, 11 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably the, one of the, one of the biggest things that would surprise people. Cool. That surprised me. So next, next rapid fire question, Max asks, who are you? Who am I? Who are you? Oh man, I'm trying to answer that question myself. You know, throw me into like <laughs> existential crisis right here. Um, yeah, maybe I mean, just, maybe just describe one word about yourself. Uh, artist. Artist. Um, George asks, boxes or briefs? Uh, Definitely briefs. I like, uh, so actually oh, I'm nearly always wearing uh, pajama pants or swim trunks. And the, <laughs> the reason I really love swim trunks is that they're very versatile. I can take off running at any time. I can jump in the pool. Um, That's so funny. I can, I can, you know, go to the gym. And they look, I, at least I think they look cool. When I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh, damn, check out those, like, Tron swim trunks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, so I think briefs are the same way. Briefs like are much more versatile than boxers. Boxers, you know, you're kind of hanging out everywhere. Uh, briefs, you know, kind of hold you together. So, yeah, definitely yeah. briefs. Cool. Which leads me to my next question. David asks, "Do you own multiple pairs of Michigan pajama pants and swap them out, or just wear the same one repeatedly?" So I have four pairs in total. I have three pairs of my new ones, which are like the the Michigan print, and then I have one pair of the the original ones which are maize and blue, but have my hometown written on the side. That's awesome. Next question. What is the real dev language? I mean, no, no JS is the only real dev language. No let's, let's be, it's been, it's been actually like, let's, let's comment on this. Like it has been crazy sure. to see node take over. Like, yes, it's like a running joke too, but it's like, uh, yeah, it's been like crazy to see how fast, uh, a new, uh, framework can can take over i guess i guess angular and react are similar examples like when angular started getting popular at hackathons next thing i knew almost every company was implementing angular into their web apps um similarly now we're seeing that with react happen even faster and i think node was kind of the predecessor there as as a more full featured you know language and framework uh like it just everyone started using node because it was just so useful for so many things despite all its shortcomings um, so that was, that was really interesting. You know, seeing the rise of node has been like, just like when I started going to hackathons, I remember the second hackathon I went to hack and why, uh, there was this company, no jitsu, which was like one of the first, uh, you know, companies that was, that was built entirely around node and using node. They did this, this live chat demo in five minutes, which was the, the original, you know, node, no demo. 
uh, and they build this live chat room coding live at this hackathon at the opening demos. And uh, everyone was just wowed and like all jumped on the URL and was able to jump in this huge chat room together and not crash it. And that was just like blew people's minds. And then of course, like <laughs> the Michigan hackers, we, we started, you know, they, they, weren't, they weren't checking for script tags. So we started playing, you know, Hail to the Victors, our fight song on everyone's laptop in the room. But, but nonetheless, nice. it was just still really, really cool to see how powerful this technology was that you could build so quickly with it. Um, and it's interesting to see like the people who were adopting these new technologies when Firebase came out, they launched at Angel Hack. Um, like most of the top hacks ended up using Firebase because these sorts of like uh, you know Node, Firebase, you know React, Angular, these give you such a huge competitive advantage in building faster that you actually like have a like order of magnitude advantage over the other programmers at your hackathon because you can just build faster. So a lot of these tools like actually do change the game that you're playing and give you a, a, a big un, un upper hand against the other, uh, other people building stuff. Hmm, that's <coughs> interesting. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. So the next rapid fire question asked on Facebook, what made you decide to propose to Ari on April 1st? Uh, Ari actually came up with the idea. I don't want to take credit for that one. Ari <laughs> messaged me. I was, I was, you know, April Fool's is my favorite holiday. Uh, and I was, I was really, really pumped. And I, I was just super busy leading up to it. So I didn't have time to think of too much stuff. So it was like 11 p.m. Uh, the, the, the day before. And then Ari messages me like, hey, we should get married. Um, and I, I like, what? And she's like, <laughs> she's like, it's April Fool's an hour. I'm like, oh, shit, yes, we should totally get married. Um, so we spent, you know, we spent the next hour writing the copy for this. We both love writing copy. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, that was fun. That, that was fun despite the, the fact that like most of my friends still think that I'm getting married. That's um, so funny. Your wedding's in like a few weeks, right? Uh, the wedding month? is in September. Yeah. It's September oh. at the, at the next M hacks. That's so funny. Well, cool. Um, so I would just want to end it off with a couple of like three final questions. Um, what is your most recommended book you would give to anyone, um, age 21. Yeah. I mean, if they haven't read how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie, they should totally read that right away. Um, a lot of the stuff yes. seems obvious, but just reinforcing the fact that, uh, that, you know, thinking of other people's interests first, um, I think this would just make like a way better world. Like so many times, even just, just reviewing people's copy, uh, is like a great example of this. They're just not, they're thinking about what they want. They're not thinking about what the other party wants. Um, so that book definitely made me like a way better listener and just a way better team member in general. Uh, so for M hacks, we have everyone read that book. Awesome. Um, and what is one parting piece of guidance and where can we find you? Parting piece of guidance. Um, you know, the, I think like time is very finite and opportunities are abundant. Um, you need to figure out like when you're, when you're saying yes to something, you're saying no to everything else. Um, so you need to figure out like, you know, what are your life goals and what are the steps that are actually going to get you there? The, one of the reasons I stopped using email is that I just evaluated, you know, the emails that I was sending and that I was receiving and, and, and evaluated it versus my, you know, my, my top three to five life goals. And 99.9% .9 of those emails were just not getting me any closer to those life goals. Um, so there's like a million different little pieces of things that you can do that don't get you closer to your life goals. Um, and you need to cut those things out of your life. Wow. I love it. And Dave, so where can we find you and how can our audience um, help you out? Yeah. I mean, um, I'm trying to, my, the, the problem that's most interesting to me is talent allocation. So I'm constantly trying to talk to uh, the most highly skilled workers as they're in the job hunt, specifically engineers. Um, so the best way that you can help me is, and, and that you can help your friends. If you have friends who are engineers who are in the job hunt, uh, introduce me to them. I'd love to just like survey them on like what their process is currently like. Um, I'm trying to track what works and what doesn't work. And then as far as reaching me, definitely shooting me a message on Facebook is the best way to reach me. Um, I get a ton of Facebook messages, but I respond to a good number of them if they're easy to respond to. Uh, so you can find me, uh, there's, I made a bitly link for this bitly slash hell. Yeah. And it's any number of L's between three and 11. Uh, so I just ran like a quick for wow. loop there. Uh, so just hell, yeah, jam on the L's a little bit, and yeah, Y-E-A-H. Um, and shoot me a message on Facebook. Awesome. I'll put that all in the show notes. But Dave, this was amazing conversation. I learned so much from you and all your <laughs> perspectives. So just 
I just love your passion and your energy. So thank you for coming on. And I'm sure the listeners will really appreciate it as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for bringing me on, Tam. It was fun. All right, Dave. Well, I'll talk to you soon, man. It was really great to talk to you. Really. I appreciate it. Yep. Take care, bud. Bye. All right. Take care, Dave. Yo, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Dave Fontenot. You can go back and see all the show notes and resources at www.outsideoftheclassroom slash Dave. Also, subscribe to the email list to get notified of my new book, Networking Success for Young Professionals. How I went from becoming a nobody to becoming connected with so many different entrepreneurs, professionals, and even other students. So you can learn all the tips and strategies I've used step by step for free. So enter your email address at www.com slash outside of the classroom.com slash networking to get a free copy of the book once it comes out. So, all right, take care. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take action and stay awesome.